All right, everybody. Um, this is the session that I have most been looking forward to today personally. Uh, when we designed this pitch session, we wanted to give a nod to our New York location. So don't worry, this isn't actually a pitch session. No one's trying to convince you to buy anything. However, what we want to do is take a look at the some of the possible answers to the question is, what are the solutions? At Secure World, we constantly get asked, how do you actually solve space sustainability problems? And most people don't like it when I tell them, well, there isn't one answer. There are a lot of answers. Regulation, international best practice, what companies are doing, these all things are relevant. But today, what we're going to hear is from five different pitches talking about things that aren't from a government and aren't necessarily from space satellite operators. These are some of the key concepts out there that might be able to contribute to space sustainability. On stage with me are our three judges who are gonna offer their insights, commentary, and feedback on our five presentations. So I would go ahead, I would like to go ahead and invite to the stage our first speaker, which is Chris Kunstadter from AXA XL to talk to us about everybody's favorite insurance. Insurance. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, yeah, no, insurance is a great way to right, come right back from the break and start talking about insurance. That's good. Um, no, but I hope you'll come away from this, uh, from my chat with you, um, with an appreciation for the role that insurance can play in space sustainability. So I'll start with a question. Um, raise your hand if you enjoy paying your car insurance or homeowner's insurance bill. Uh, there was one over there. Wow, that's a first. Um, but um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the response I usually get. That's okay. And undoubtedly, some of you have, uh, in the audience have filed insurance claims for you know, your car, your home, whatever. I have with my daughter. Uh, when, she got, when my daughter got her driver's license, she had three accidents in four months. And uh, she's fine, just a bruised ego. And she's grown out of it now. But uh, my insurance premiums went up. And that was definitely an incentive for her to drive more safely. So space insurance is a critical enabler of uh, innovation and investment. It allows organizations and enterprises to take risks, and it facilitates investors to support them. But the risk landscape is changing. I've got to keep an eye on the clock here. Um, with new technologies and applications, innovative launch vehicles and satellites, human space flight, and commercial space stations. And along with those comes a more congested space environment and new threats from cyber and, and international conflict in space. As insurers, our product, we cover all the technical risk throughout the life cycle of our, of our clients' satellites, launch vehicles, space platforms, and deep space exploration. Um, so we take all the technical risk. We exclude war, terrorism, and cyber, but we cover everything else, whether it's collision risk, space weather, internal breakdown, what have you. Um, so to mitigate risks, we support safe and responsible space activity. That should go without saying. And we incentivize good behavior. In short, we support space sustainability. But we need to do three things to make sure we're on the right track. We need to define our terms precisely. We need to state our assumptions explicitly. And we need to make sure we understand the limitations of the tools and models we use. Sustainability has many definitions. For us in the risk business, it means being able to characterize, manage, and mitigate our risks. And we need to make sure that our clients and the whole space industry, in fact, can do likewise with their risks. To accomplish this, we promote the development and use of technologies that reduce uncertainty in space situational awareness, and we support on-orbit servicing, and in particular, active debris removal. ADR is expensive and is time-consuming, and frankly, it's not here yet. It's years away. That's okay. That's why we're developing an, an innovative insurance product to enhance space safety and help kickstart the ADR industry. More on that as time goes on. Insurance companies are concerned, insurance companies writ large, are concerned about risks, existential risks, like geopolitical instability, climate change, cyber threats, and more. Our job is to get as smart as we can while helping the industry to be sustainable. We need to characterize risk better, assess the probability and consequence of collision risk and space war risk, among many others. 
That's why we've worked with Leo Labs and others in the SSA world to develop collision risk tools and with governments and academia to calculate the risk and consequence of war in space. At AXA XL, we embrace risk. We make space for new ideas and we develop new ideas for space. Thank you, and I will cede the remainder of my time. All right, well, Chris, thank you. Um, setting the bar really high for uh, making your pitch and, and being clear and concise. I'm gonna turn it over, uh, if you wanna come back up on stage, you get to ask, um, uh, our judges are gonna ask uh, a few clarifying questions. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. I wasn't ready for this. Hey, Chris. Yes. Uh, Nick Milburn, how are Nick. you? Just, uh, love the presentation, by the way. A, a quick question, I mean, how, with, with the changing technology so rapid these days, I mean, how do you, remain profitable and, and how do you, how much anal analysis is there of the te technical products to make sure that you are assessing the risk accurately? Yeah, very good question. Uh, the, assessing technical risk is really the foundation of what we do. We want to make sure that we understand what can go wrong and what happens if it does go wrong. So we spend a lot of time, I have a great team, I have two people here in New York and two in Paris who do a lot of the analytical work to figure out what, what can go wrong with a satellite, what can go wrong with a launch vehicle. These, my team has extensive experience in the industry, so they and I, I've been in the business for 40 years, we've seen a lot of technologies come and go, we've seen a lot of failures. And every time there's a failure, we delve deep into it to make sure we understand what went wrong and what's being done to fix it. So the technical is really probably the biggest gate we have to go through. Thank you. Hmm. You can go ahead if you like. Hi, thanks a lot for this sure. perfect presentation in such a quick time. Um, so my quick question here is that, how can the space and satellite insurance sector incentivize like, commercial space activities to be compliant with like, space sustainability? And do you see like, limitations and challenges from your perspective? That's one we think about a lot. So, you know, everyone wants a good driver discount, right? Because everyone thinks they're a good driver. Uh, my daughter notwithstanding. Um, uh, but really, the way we look at it is we want people to recognize that being responsible in space, doing the right thing, doesn't get you a gold star. It gets you in the door. It's, it's the least you can do is be responsible. If you go above and beyond, that's when you will get uh, rewarded. Now, because everyone wants a discount, we might have to say, okay, if you do these things, if you use this technology, if you use these tools, you will get a discount maybe for a year or something. But once the industry uh, understands that our, whatever our solution is that we're suggesting is ubiquitous, then it's more that those who don't use it will get a surcharge. So of course, we can't afford to dig too deeply into our, um, into our profitability such as it is, which is not sometimes. Um, but uh, you know, ours is a very volatile business, so we need to make sure we manage the volatility. So we can't just be giving good driver discounts. We really do try to stress that responsible beha behavior is the baseline. It's not, your, it's not what you aspire to. So Chris, in a nutshell, your proposal is to, uh, that insurers should incentivize good behavior. Um, is that, is it, that's it? I have been doing insurance, space insurance for 40 years. I don't really know much else. I can play guitar, I can write a song, but, I, but in terms of, um, of uh, trying to get the industry to be responsible and to support sustainability and to be sustainable, yeah, okay, we work with policymakers, legislators, space agencies, other uh, parts of governments to try and discuss how we approach risk and how we would like to make sure that risk is recognized. Um, I think it's uh, one of the points I made was that, and I'm gonna have to go back through my notes here and I'll be quick because I know we're almost running out of time, um, okay. is that we need to um, uh, not, just define the, um, not just define the problems, but we need to recognize the assumptions we're making. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we, use a model for SSA. As uh, Rich Dalbello was saying very eloquently this morning, 
you know, he, he sees it as the atomization of the SSA industry, where a lot of people are coming up with a lot of different solutions, and it's hard to know, to derive from that, what's truth, right? What's the truth solution for that particular satellite up in orbit? So, you know, we're trying to incentivize by being vocal. I've ne never met a microphone I didn't like. And, um, and just trying to make sure that people understand that insurance will support and uh, it'll support innovation and investment, um, but we expect in return that people will learn to be responsible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I know for me, one of the takeaways is something that we at Secure World cannot agree more with, which is responsible behavior as a baseline, right? That this is, that is, that is where we're starting, ideally, and we want to grow from there. Um, so thank you, Chris, for, for being our guinea pig, being our, our first one up on stage. We really appreciate that. I want to give a thank you to our judges. For those of you who haven't met them yet, we have Brian Berger from Space News. We have Sanjudi Malik from Comspot Corporation. And we have Nicholas Milburn from Millbank offering a variety of different perspectives, as you've just seen. I would now like to go ahead and welcome to the stage our next speaker. That is going to be Brian Lagana from Confers, who will be talking about the role that industry standards can potentially play in supporting space sustainability. Brian? Thanks, Crystal. Uh, before I go into um, my actual pitch, I just wanted to kind of provide a, a level set for um, for the rest of my comments or, uh, later on. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, CONFERS, uh, the Consortium for the Execution of Rendezvous and Servicing Operations, was uh, founded about six years ago uh, in 2017 as a public-private partnership between um, DARPA under the Department of Defense and the satellite servicing industry. Uh, their, their main remit at the time was developing um, uh, cooperatively standards for OOS and RPO in uh, low Earth orbit and geosynchronous Earth orbit. Uh, fast forward to the end of last year, CONFERS becomes a standalone 506, uh, 501c6 uh, global trade association. Um, our main focus is still developing standards for the industry, but we've taken on more of a, a global view. Um, we're also um, expanding a bit into some other areas um, outside of uh, simply RPO and OOS. We're looking at, um, uh, and we're not limiting to, to these areas, but um, they include ISAM, maintenance and repair, and inspection. Um, as uh, with um, other traditional trade associations, we're also into advocacy education through our um, Global Satellite Servicing Forum and uh, news and information through our digital newsletter. So I think CONFERS is somewhat uniquely qualified to, to speak to the, uh, the benefits of voluntary uh, industry standard setting. Uncomfortable pause. Space is a risky business. Uh, space operations are inherently risky, expensive, complex operations involving multiple domestic and international collaborators and have been traditionally limited to uh, more developed uh, national economies. With that came uh, uh, with, with the introduction of, of the private sector into this, it, it kind of showed a lack of clear, widely accepted technical and safety standards um, for responsible performance of OOS and RPO operations um, involving commercial satellites. And it's an obstacle to satellite servicing becoming a major industry and could lead to incidents that put long-term sustainability of the space economy at risk by casting doubt on its commercial viability, um, or, uh, even worse, inviting greater governmental scrutiny and uninformed uh, regulations. So why are voluntary industry standards important? Voluntary industry standards work to achieve uh, substantially within the respective industries or professions uh, by ensuring safety, security, access, quality, and equality. 
Most importantly, uh, they can help either advise agencies or, in worst case scenarios, help to preempt um, unnecessary regulations or, if necessary, serve as guidance to government agencies around the world when promulgating uh, regulations becomes unavoidable. Industry standards have been around for centuries. Uh, one graphic there, uh, the stained glass window is um, from the uh, Cathedral at Chartres in, in France, and it is a representation of uh, the Spice Guild and a few of its members conducting trade. Um, Europe's medieval uh, merchant and crafts guilds are one of the, the earliest examples of organizational standard setting. There are also some uh, ex uh, early examples of anti-competitive activity as well, but that's another story. Uh, today, industries and their associations have been increasingly taking the lead in voluntary standards development as a way to self-regulate and uh, hopefully mitigate um, uh, government intervention into their affairs. Um, industry standards make processes and facilities safer. They help pr uh, prove compliance with regulations when there are regulations. I'm thinking healthcare, transportation off the top of my head. Um, and they make it easier to train and cross-train people with, uh, in, who are in technical jobs. And finally, they encourage innovation. Uh, before joining Confer, a couple examples that, that I can share with you is um, I was with the Pedorthic Foot Care Association for um, 11 years. And um, for anyone who's interested in what a pedorthist is, as opposed to a podiatrist, I have a 30-second elevator speech that I'd be happy to share later. But essentially, um, we were faced with the challenge of having the ability to uh, be a regulated profession. Um, but the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, the secretary uh, whom had the authority to implement um, uh, certification guidelines for people who would bill a certain benefit that my members um, uh, would uh, seek reimbursement from chose not to um, until 2017. So you're looking at a 40 plus year gap of um, a regulatory um, uh, Void. Uh, we took it upon ourselves to instead start to implement uh, state regulation. We um, were successful um, in advancing uh, licensure laws in 11 states when I left in 2014, and that was on top of the voluntary certification that already existed within within the profession, but wasn't recognized by. Uh, Medicare. And uh, uh, my time with American Trucking Association uh, saw the uh, development of some standards related to um, equipment specification, drug testing, uh, fatigue tolerance, and one that I had a, a, a big role in that we're very proud of was um, standards to uh, determine the preventability of commercial motor vehicle accidents. Um, confers, as, as many of you probably know, um, because but there are a lot of our members here too, which I'm, I'm happy to see, um, has worked to develop industry-led recommendations for standards that contribute to a sustainable, safe, and diverse in-space economy and has contributed to multiple standards related to satellite servicing. Um, a few of them um, right off the top of my head is uh, one that has been published by ISO um, about RPO and OOS uh, programmatic principles and practices. Uh, we have three that are going through the AIAA um, review process now on uh, spacecraft fiducial markers, um, in space storable fluid transfer interfaces, and the, the newest one is on free flyer capture. Um, two folks um, uh, on our uh, technical working group, um, Ron Burke from the Aerospace Corporation and Steve Leeds, um, uh, Steve Leet, I'm sorry, from Northrop Grumman, uh, have led a very dedicated, very engaged group of um, professionals on that working group to uh, start to promulgate all of these uh, industry standards. So all of these standards, at the end of the day, help. They're all voluntary, of course, but they all go to a few different points. One, they help foster unmanned and manned exploration of Earth and beyond. They maintain national security. They encourage the effective and peaceful use of outer space to create opportunity and prosperity, hopefully for all, uh, at different levels. 
And finally, they promote, to, to Chris's point, um, innovation by de-risking investment and accelerating the adoption of new technologies through confidence and performance. And in conclusion, um, we need to remember that well-conceived standards minimize the need for and risk of regulations uh, being developed by government agencies. Um, however, when it's felt that uh, government agencies need to promulgate regulations, um, these uh, uh, voluntary standards serve as excellent um, foundations uh, for the development of um, regulations um, and they also to help inform the, the regulatory agencies who may not have uh, the knowledge, the background that you have in the industry to really put together regulations that everyone can live with. There are always going to be some um, uh, one-offs that everyone hates, but for the most part, solid um, industry-derived st standards can drive a, a significant positive regulatory regime. And that's why CONFERS has such a role in uh, the development of these uh, voluntary industry standards. And we work with um, AIAA, ISO, and um, uh, ANSI um, as the standard developing organizations. Um, it, uh, CONFERS is the, the birthplace for the concepts for um, industry standards, and then we take it to the uh, SDOs to, um, to socialize it with the public, take, intern take uh, internal and external comment, and eventually deliver the final result. So standards are good, better than regulation, but at the end of the day, if regulation's necessary, you've got a good solid foundation to build those from. Brian, Brian, where does Comfers anticipate seeing like the most industry clash? Would it be in something like reentry guidelines, maneuverability guidelines, spacecraft having to identify themselves? Um, where do you expect to see industry clash in trying to set um, voluntary regulations here? You know, uh, to be completely frank with you, I, I could not tell you at this moment. We have, um, we have three splinter groups right now that are working. Um, they're at the, the very beginning of starting to develop um, uh, recommendations for standards that speak to those three areas that you, are, that you just mentioned. Um, th and I've been sitting in all, on all of their, their calls. We haven't had anything contentious come up per se, unless there are some offline conversations that I'm not listening to. But um, the, the general consensus is the, the components that they're putting into them right now are agreeable within the industry uh, players, the industry stakeholders that are part of those splinter groups. And again, that's not to say that as those, um, those um, proposed uh, standards make their way through the process, public comment, um, comment from other industry stakeholders might throw a monkey wrench into that. Um, but right now, I'm not seeing that. Thank you. Hi, Brian. Uh, Hi. Thanks a lot for the presentation. So I was wondering, how does CONFERS effectively like, promote industry standards for space sustainability? And also, like we have been here today since morning, we, we've talked about how industry standards are not, not just the laws, right? Like you are unable to implement them. So what more can industry, uh, like organizations such as yours, do more than just persuasion? So I'm sorry, the, the question is what more can we be doing to, to advance um, industry standards, either our own or others out there? Yes, how do you effectively promote them and what more can you do uh, more than just persuading well, like effectiveness. The, the standards that we're developing, uh, that CONFERS is developing, are those that are specifically identified to, to the satellite servicing industry and beyond um, within uh, uh, low Earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit, and beyond to uh, cislunar and, and beyond that. So the standards are... I, I wouldn't say they're bespoke to confers. I like to think that we represent the voice of the entire 
um, satellite servicing industry. Um, so beyond that, I guess getting our message out is um, one, you know, letting letting the industry know what we've been doing, and we we had a really good start with that last month with our uh, state of the association webinar. Um, we had uh, close to 200 um, individuals register for it. We had 145 on, and that was a great opportunity for the uh, uh, for the technical working group, especially, and their three splinter groups to kind of go over what they're working on. Um, they did receive some feedback from uh, from the members and and non members that were on that webinar. And, you know, they're taking all of that back into consideration, but that's going to be one of our vehicles to get the word out there, not only about our standards, but also that are relevant to the industry that are being developed elsewhere. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brian. I have to say, as a space industry professional, I'm actually really pleased to know that we are learning from other industries and bringing in experts from the outside when it comes to trucking, or I didn't quite, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the other one. Um, but, but we often think of ourselves as special, and it's great to see when we are incorporating and thinking about what best practice from across many industries can look like. Our next speaker is going to be Claire Fairfield from the Venture Capital Institute, and he's going to be talking to us today about the role of investment. Claire? Uh, thank you, and thank you to the Secure World Foundation for having me here today. I'm going to steal a little bit of time from Chris that he gave up because I need a group therapy session now because he mentioned paying for car insurance for children. I, I happen to marry a slightly deranged Greek woman, which is kind of par for the course, and she decided we should have a huge family, so I got to pay for car insurance for seven children. And I'm just shaking right here thinking of that. Now, the punchline to that, the follow-up, is what Chris's industry prepared me for were four of the daughters getting married in a 10-month period. So I'm happy to be here, and I hope somebody wants to pass the hat for me at some point. So um, I want to talk about venture capital and private equity and how that impacts what, uh, what everybody is trying to do here, and that is create a responsible, sustainable space industry. And I, I'm here to tell you that while everybody gets excited about raising capital, venture capital and private equity to a certain extent can be very dangerous, actually. And the history of venture capital, how, how venture capital is managed and, and how people conduct themselves can, can be problematic in the space environment. And I want to just take you through this very, very quickly. And so, um, you know, very briefly, what are the characteristics of venture capital investing? And I'm, I'm skipping some, trying to get to the really important ones. It is a high risk, high return in, endeavor. It is rocket fuel. And the people who give venture capitalists their money want, want those very high returns. And that's something to keep in mind. The early venture capitalists, and I would argue the most successful venture capitalists in history were in the 70s and through the 80s. But the original venture capitalists were not financial managers. They were entrepreneurs. They were engineers. They were CEOs. They were people who had built companies before. And as the industry has evolved, there is a core of really good VCs. They're all actually pretty good VCs. The problem is the mindset now is how much can I make, how fast can I make it, and when can I move on to the next one? And there's a constant optimization that goes on that I want to talk about. Um, the job of venture capitalists and any investor is really to identify risk, quantify that risk, and manage that risk. But more importantly, to determine if that risk is manageable. And space has some inherently risky factors to it that we'll talk about. Also keep in mind that historically, it's a very low funding rate for venture capital. Oftentimes, 1% to 2% of business plans actually get funded. Of those plans, 80 to 90% will probably fail. And the reason I mention that is space, depending on how we define space, and I'll get into that in just a second, really is, it's, it, it impacts what the costs of failure are, much more so than most other types of investing. Um, also understand that nobody talks about this, particularly in our industry, but relatively few venture capitalists actually make money. The top 10 to 15 percent of funds garner almost all of the returns. And that's something to think about because it's not just the companies that are failing then. That flows backwards up into the venture funds. And also uh, how a venture fund is structured is really important for people to understand because a typical venture fund lasts for 10 years 
And that really means they invest their money for about five years because the, the last half of the fund is meant for the active, more active management of the investments, harvesting those investments, selling them, merging them, um, you know, doing IPOs if that's possible. And so that really means when you're talking to a venture fund, it's much better if you have a space investment if you're talking to them in year one than year five because their outlook changes very dramatically in terms of the type of companies they will invest in based on timing. Um, the, the whole idea of venture capital in many ways that's talked about is fail fast and move on. How that failure is accomplished is really important in the context of space, and I'll touch on that again also. Milestone investing is a great aspect of venture capital. Basically says, look, you think you need $20 million, let's break that up into five, $4 million chunks, and as you achieve milestones, we'll put that additional money in for that next milestone. That's great for the entrepreneur because it usually gives you a better valuation over time, and it's great for the investor because you're not putting all your eggs in that one basket. Again, this could be problematic for space investing. Um, also, it's all about time and opportunity optimization. What does that mean? Historically, you might have a portfolio of, say, 10 companies, and there are two or three that you think might be okay, but there are another two that clearly seem to be the winners. The idea there may be, we're just going to stop with the two to three that are okay and really focus on the two that appear to be great. And again, in the context of space, what does it mean to stop an investment along those lines? And then venture capital and private equity have an interesting relationship because you know, when mar times are good and markets are good, venture capitalists kind of pass their companies off to the, the private equity folks who pay a much larger valuation and then it's their problem. Great example would be Uber. As soon as the Saudis put money into a $60 billion valuation, my thought was, well, that is gonna be the end of Uber, right? That's gonna be a really rough ride for them. And it has been for them in many ways. Um, so let's talk about space investing. I think the Carmen line, which you know, some people say it's a good delineator, others don't, but it kind of defines the risk line for investors in the sense that any space investment you can make that you're basically doing on the ground, it could be software, it could be hardware, things you can do there where you don't have to launch them into the great beyond, that's a fundamentally different investment than once you get it up in space. Um, investment timeline versus operational timeline. I talked about this, right? It's difficult to fund a lot of space projects if you're going to use traditional venture capital because the fund wants to be wound up in 10 years and some of these funds are simply not going to be wound up that fast. Also, exit strategy and end of life is really important. That's one of the greatest responsibilities I think we have as space investors and as entrepreneurs. What happens when things go wrong? What happens when a space asset is at the end of its useful life? You know, most uh, investors aren't typically in the business of paying for the proper disposal of assets that no longer have value. And so there are questions about how do we deal with that in the, in the space con context. Um, and I should have punched the button, shouldn't I? Um, and then also, do we really understand the market, the customers, and the economics of space? We're already seeing the commoditization of telecommunication services and data services, right? It's, it reminds me of the early days of the PC industry. There were 110 companies, there were 112 that were founded to build hard drives. We're gonna have lots of constellations that are gonna be created. There will be a few winners and there'll be lots of losers. And again, what does losing mean in that context? What do we do with constellations that are no longer economically viable? How are they taken care of? And I think one of the problems with that is this ultimate failure, how do we deal with failure, is at the end of the day, who bears the ultimate burden of that risk, right? And, and I believe, unfortunately, that risk will have to be borne by governments at the end of the day. It's no different than the markets figured out in 2008 when the world was crashing, that what happened was what the markets had bet on is the government would step in to clean that up. And that's what will probably have to happen in space at times because Companies that really don't have the money to clean up a failure are going to have a difficult time actually finding that money to do that. And then one of the things to think about then, do we throw milestone investing out the window? Do we say enough money has to be put in place to actually deal with potential end-of-life issues, whether it's success or a failure? Again, just something to think about in that context. So regulatory and jurisdiction in, uh, jurisdictional investors, who will get me to space? That's one of the big issues because that's one of the challenges here. One of the great risks is there are lots of governments, lots of countries who want to be into space. Not all will act as responsibly as others. Uh, and that is a huge risk. 
Um, space is a resource for all. Where is the ultimate accountability and responsibility? Investors have to play an important role in that because if we provide, if we provide the money, people will take it typically. And then I think one of the greatest risks, and understand, as I said early on, Venture capital is about identifying, quantifying, and then seeing if you can manage risk. The geopolitical risk surrounding space is massive, and it's getting worse every day. You know, the 800-pound gorilla in the room is always the relationship between China and the United States, and it's not getting better at this point. And all bets are off. You know, we, we, we've, we've talked about, you know, the effect of space junk cascading through um, orbit. Well, if there is a real clash between the United States and China, one of the first things to go will be satellites. And what does that really mean for the rest of space? So can we manage that risk? And also, at the end of the day, as has been touched on here, it's a big, beautiful, wonderful place. It's a fragile place in many ways based on what we can do to do it. And then also, what are the reality-based business models? What, what does it really mean to do mining in space, to do mining in asteroids, to do lunar mining? Will there really be markets that will support that? Other than so much of this is driven by satellites right now. It's a fantastic market, you know, refueling, um, maintenance, you know, disposal at end of life, all of those things. What are the other economics that people are getting excited about? You know, we'll, we'll build some space stations. What do the economics really look like in the long term there? That's a difficult thing to say. It is a bit of a if you build it, they will come kind of approach. But we just have to be very, very careful in, in, the, in that context and understand that investors at the end of the day want to make money for their investors and for themselves, which means they have a very different perspective than doing necessarily what is right from an environmental standpoint. And it will be important to try to get voluntary standards uh, and some mandatory standards put in place to at least lower the risk of the danger of having assets abandoned in space. So last thing I will say, because I'm sure I'm running out of time. Uh, the, uh, that's, you do that very well, by the way, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> is, you know, I've, I've touched on all these things. I'm not going to read through them, but, but understand one of the things that's really important in sustainability is we have to get this right as investors because if capital cannot be made available, that'll shut the door to space as much as space debris circling the planet. And Never forget that when it comes to anything in life, particularly investing, luck and timing matter, and you just have to go along for the ride on that. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. That was, that was great. Um, I just wanted to touch on kind of the last thing you talked sure. about, which is the, you know, obviously you have to be hyper-focused on returns for your investors. And where, where have you seen kind of the convergence between the ability to have a business plan that is profitable versus, you know, as well as a benefit to the environment and to space sustainability? Well, I think, we may, I think we may go back to the future, so to speak, because one of the great untold stories of Silicon Valley is there is a single family that provided over half the financing into Silicon Valley through the 1970s up to the mid-1980s. And what that really represented was patient capital. They were not driven by this. It was their money, right? It was a private family office. It was, they were driven by doing neat things. They wanted to, and they, they didn't need immediate returns. They were one of the five wealthiest families in the country. They wanted to see what interesting things they could do and preserve capital. And if it took 15 years, they were fine with that. I think private families and private individuals could be the key to some of this. I mean, I don't think it's, uh, it's a coincidence that you have Granson and Bezos uh, and, um, Oh, God, and, and Musk, right? They took a ton of money they made on other things mm -hmm. and then went into, in, into the space business. And I think that, that may be part of the solution there uh, because that, they, they'll have the patience. They have no choice once you do it, right? You're kind of forced into being patient. But they also have the ability to withstand that, and they have that entrepreneurial spirit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks a lot for the presentation. And I was uh, especially very impressed with the 1% or 2% get funded, the, the numbers that you gave there. I was curious to know that what criteria or metrics do you or should you use as venture capitalists to um, assess the sustainability impact for like space ventures, investments right. that you make in space uh, ventures? Um, at least as I would look at sustainability, to me, the, the most concerning factor is what happens if something doesn't work or when it's at end of life, those types of things. So if a team walks in and they're, they're talking about that, they have a plan for that, that's a metric I would use to look at that particular organization. But I think independent of that, it has to, it has to be something you're proactive about because there are two ways to look at this. Um, you could say, 
I'm going to make money while I can, and that's what happens, right? Because one of the problems with the venture industry, like all financial industries, they're a big herd of people. Like, that's what's happened now in space. A few years ago, here comes the herd because it was the cool thing to do, and nobody got in trouble for investing in space. All of a sudden, they're finding out it's a bit harder than everybody thought it was. There's a pullback that's, that has happened. You'll see that cycle again and again. We've seen it over s uh, several um, different cycles in the venture industry, and so... Yes, you could say, I made a bunch of money because I got $200 million because I sold the URL for dogfood.com during the internet years, right? But what did you do to actually create a sustainable industry there? And so part of it is the attitude. And, and that, I mean, it's a very nebulous thing. But, um, yeah, you know, and, and again, for some, you could say, if we can stay the course, we will make a ton of money in this one, right? So. Thank you. Okay, is that it? All right, thank you very much. Well, we asked our speakers to pull no punches, and I think Claire took us very seriously with outlining uh, what some of the possibilities and also the concerns when it comes to this kind of investment are. So thank you very much, Claire. Uh, next, I would like to welcome Carolyn Bell, who is here representing Astroscale, and is going to be talking about some of the research and, and things that they've been looking at when it comes to circular economy and the role that that can play in space sustainability. Claire, or Caroline, my apologies. It all flows together in the end. Um, all right, so space debris, it's a problem. Look at all that, that's why we're all here today, right? What if we're not, what if we're wrong? What if space debris is an opportunity? What if it is the opportunity that we as an industry need to transform our future in space and turn it into that potential future that, that we're really capable of, that a lot of us dreamed of as kids and why we got into this industry. I think that the, the looming risk that's created by satellite launch rates really gives us an opportunity to transform not only how we operate in space and, and to enable space sustainability, but to change more than that, to change how we conduct business in space, how we research and understand new scientific principles by our actions in space, how we achieve national security, via space. So let's explore uh, how a circular economy will help us achieve this, will help us achieve this space sustainability. So here we have uh, the, the history of the space industry to date. So this is cumulative objects uh, that have been launched, and we see steadily increasing launch rates over time. Pretty manageable end of life timelines, pretty steady growth in the number of objects that are on orbit, moving in a positive direction. And by uh, some estimates, uh, this is one potential future uh, that is in front of us in space if we continue on as we are. A rapid increase in launch rates and a significant amount of growth in the number of objects that are on orbit, whether those are alive and operational or whether they're derelict. Now, we all want to see this growth, right? I certainly want to see huge amounts of economic activity, of scientific activity, of benefits to humanity that come from space. We've talked about that today. But we want to do it sustainably. So can we do that by doing things the way that we always have done, where we launch a new satellite any time that we want to replace an old one or expand coverage or provide a new capability? All right, this is our model for space today, how we operate in space. It's linear, it's directional, and it moves from one step to the next, to the next, to the next, until you reach the end, and then we start all the way back over at the beginning. Do the whole thing again. So we extract resources and spend them when we build satellites. We spend resources when we build launch vehicles, and then we burn propellant to put those satellites into orbit. And when we reach the nominal end of life of whatever the mission was designed to do, we throw away those resources, either by leaving them in space to become space debris in a responsible orbit or not, or we burn them up on re-entry. We are throwing away those resources before they've really reached their full potential and their full utilization rates. The other thing that's at play here, which we heard some of the earlier speakers talk about, is that there are externalities along this entire value chain. Not only is it the resource extraction itself, but many other factors that are at play many of which we don't even realize today. 
This is why it's so important uh, to do these life cycle assessments that were talked about in the ESG talk earlier this afternoon to really understand the impact of our actions across this whole value chain. But even if we do that, and even if we really understand this, this value chain, and even if we add innovation, if we sprinkle in new capabilities and new ways of doing things that add efficiency and, and reduce the, the impact on the economy, a linear economy is never really sustainable. It's not truly a sustainable solution in the long term. We're not constrained, though, to this way of operating in space just because it's what we're used to doing and what we're good at. We have the ability to replace this last link in the chain, this, this end of life box that I have here, with a step into a circular process for these resources that we have so intently put into space. Instead of abandoning them or throwing them away, we can take those resources and use them again and again to deliver value multiple times in multiple ways to multiple different users. That is a circular economy in space. So circular economies are something that we are pretty familiar with terrestrially, even if we don't think about it. When was the last time, and I'm thinking it was about an hour ago or two hours ago after lunch, um, that you used the recycling bins out there or you used a compostable product? Something that after it had addressed its first use case and, and provided value to you, uh, can be used again in something else rather than just put into the, the landfill side of that waste bin. We can do the same thing in space. So when we implement a circular economy in space, once we have things up there, I mean, we still have to address that. Um, we can do things like repair satellites, repair components. We have a solar array that doesn't deploy when we get on orbit. Let's repair the mechanism. I'd rather do that than spend hundred, hundred and fifty million dollars and wait a couple years to get a new satellite up there. And I'm pretty sure that Chris doesn't want to pay out the full size of the claim. He'd rather pay for uh, fixing it. We can recycle components. And that's not just the thousands of satellites that are yet to launch, because we need to be thinking about what happens to those at end of life. We still want them to launch. We still want them to provide value. And then let's recycle them into something new. The other thing that's up there that we can recycle all the debris that we're so worried about. We can take something that today provides a risk and a problem to how we operate in space, and we can turn it into an asset that injects value into this circular economy, into this cycle. We can bring something and take those materials, recycle them into something new. And in that way, we can see that objects that we see today as being worthless and risky and dangerous can actually uh, we have inherent value in them that we can turn into something else. So this is beneficial to us too. After we've done that repair, uh, we can regenerate those materials. Uh, we can use uh, 3D printing in space. Uh, we can use assembly in space. Maybe we haven't fully recycled things. We can do regeneration without that too. Um, and build new capabilities. We can build new structures. We can build new satellites. Instead of launching everything fresh from the ground, the other benefit that we get here is that we can build things that would be either impossible or cost prohibitive to launch from the ground. James Webb, really cool. Uh, I want the next generation of space telescope to have an even larger mirror, probably one that doesn't have to unfold in a really complicated manner, but one that we can build in space. Energy is a limitation here on Earth. What if we can, yes, I know this is a holy grail that's been talked about for decades, space, solar power. Is it more effective to build that in space? Maybe is that a possibility? How do we build space stations in space? There are a lot of opportunities for when you have the ability to construct structures on orbit. And because I did come from a biology background, I'm aware that very few systems uh, do not are, are fully closed loop. So no, it's not going to be a closed loop cycle. We are going to have to remove things. We are going to create waste. We are going to, to have things that cannot be reused in this circular economy. But that's OK, because when we create it, we'll be responsible. We will remove it and make sure that that waste does not become a risk for the vibrant economy that we've created in space. We will leverage life extension to 
use satellites for longer. This is another thing that we've heard talked about today. If you can use a satellite for longer than perhaps its original design life to continue getting more value out of that object that you place into space, you can reduce the number of things you launch. Instead of launching every 15 years, you launch every 20. Over time, you're launching fewer things to space, which means you're having less of an impact on the Earth when you build those spacecraft, when you launch those spacecraft, and overall putting fewer things in space, which helps with the space sustainability side as well. So it really helps with the entire value chain. And finally, at least finally, as far as the circle goes, I am very happy if any of you have other ideas for what we should put into here. Um, has to start with an R though, that's the rule. We can reuse capabilities in space. We can reuse structures and components that can be reused and replace just those things that need to be replaced. Structure of a satellite still works. Most of the functions of the bus still work. Let's replace the payload with something that is more appropriate to whatever customer base you're going after at that point in time. Have an upper stage left in orbit. There are ideas out there to turn those into space station modules. Let's be creative and find ways to reuse some of what we put in space without even necessarily needing to put it through the recycling cycle. We have the capability to change how we design spacecraft, to design for modularity, to design for reuse and repair. And I also think that would be cool for the space industry and I think would help us bring some of those young engineers who are looking for something interesting and vibrant and inspiring to do, give them the opportunity to change how things have been done, to invent new ways of operating in space and thereby helping us grow our industry as well. Um, all right, so who, who can be involved with this? I keep saying we, who's the we? Well, it's all of us in this room, as you anticipated. Everyone has a role in this, regulators have a role in this. People like uh, Office of Commerce is here today, CAA from the UK is here today. Manufacturers like Maxar, our sponsor, is here today and they have a role in this. Launch and space access providers have a role to play in this. SpaceX, not in the room, that's a bit awkward, but they have a role to play in this as well. <laughs> Operators like Viasat, like Iridium, like OneWeb, they have a role to play in this. In orbit servicing providers, like ClearSpace, like Starfish, yes, like Astroscale, we have a role to play in this. And as the space economy grows, as it becomes more diverse, more vibrant, there are new requirements, there are new opportunities, and new companies will come out. They're gonna look to Claire for investment, and they will have a role to play in this as well. So when we create a sustainable space economy by implementing circularity, we will be able to change and grow what we do in space in ways that we haven't imagined. It will be dynamic. It will be a web of connections, of capabilities, of products, of services that can make our space economy stronger and more resilient. The circular economy in space is our sustainable solution. When we change how we operate in space and design sustainability in from the beginning, it's not a tacked on afterthought. It doesn't have the risk of becoming greenwashing. It is an integral part to how we will succeed in space. And the challenge is broader than what any of us can do alone. So I look forward to working with you on all of it and all of you telling me what you will do to bring the circular economy to reality. Please do it over a drink. I've had this guy on my wrist all day. Thank you. Okay, one question. Does anybody have a burning one? Carolyn, I think that's a great graphic. It describes a lot of things that are in the pipeline. We've seen some of the stuff demonstrated like service life extension. Um, I guess my question for you, and you're with a company that, does, um, that, that wants to do ADR, how, did the, how do you make the business case close for something like ADR absent a government mandate? Right? We heard from Claire that VCs will fund a lot of companies that are gonna fail and then it's up to the government to clean up the mess. The government could contract an astro scale, but, but how does this happen, you know, absent some sort, of, some sort of mandate? I think it's a question of which sort of ADR you're talking about. If we're talking about debris that's already up there that was put in space by governments, it's a different answer than if we're talking about moving forward in the future. And that's why I think it's important that we're here today to make sure we're not creating an ADR problem for 10 years from now with new debris that's created. That being said, one of the things that we've looked at at Astroscale is making sure that we have a diversified capability set where our business is something that 
has the technology to address ADR type applications, the ability to approach to capture an unprepared non-controlled object uh, and remove it. That same technology can be applied to other things that have different uh, revenue generating sides to them. Um, so I think that balancing piece is a, is a helpful part of looking for ADR, but I don't think it's fair for us to completely let governments off the hook. Uh, especially those governments that have been involved in creating that debris uh, from the get-go, some of what we've seen launched since the late 50s. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Carolyn. I'm definitely going to take away the idea of the idea of how understanding better that a linear economy is not sustainable and thinking critically about what a circular economy in space might be and that it doesn't just apply to satellites, it applies to exploration, it applies to telescopes and research and all sorts of things. So thank you for that great overview. Our last speaker in this pitch session today is going to be Masa Ishida from the Space Tide Foundation, who's going to be giving us some insights into the role that terrestrial companies might play in space sustainability. Masa? So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Masa Ishida, a CEO of the Space Tide Foundation. So, thank you for our Secure World Foundation for having me at uh, such a great event today. So I'm from Japan. So actually, uh, I, I arrived in New York uh, yesterday. So I still feel jet lag. So now Japan is a uh, very early morning. So but I will do my best. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, most of you are not familiar with my activities. So let me briefly uh, my foundation. So we Space Tide Foundation uh, is a Tokyo-based nonprofit organization uh, with a mission to uh, create and ox orchestrate an ecosystem for Japan's commercial space industry. Uh, we hold uh, one of the largest commercial space conferences in Asia, and also uh, provide a database for analyzing their space start startup ecosystem. And also, uh, we are operating uh, Japan's first uh, acceleration program to space entrepreneurs. So through these various activities, so we have been contributing to the development of commercial space ecosystem in Japan. So let me uh, move on to my presentation. The key word of my, of my presentation is a new to space industry. So I think our, you know, uh, Japan has seen 50 years of space development led by a national space agency. So our, it has mainly driven by the science and the technological perspective. However, interest in commercial space is increasing in both the public and the private sectors. So Japanese government see commercial space as an area of future growth has been implementing a variety of measures to encourage the space activities in the private sectors. So as a result, we can see sign of a new or space ecosystem. You know, industrial ecosystem for government-led space development uh, looks like a pyramid structure with a space agency at the top. On the other hand, industrial ecosystem for commercial space is becoming more diversified. So with the number of stakeholders increasing as well, I believe or this wide variety of stakeholders should have to act harmoniously each other to achieve the progress of the industry as a whole. But our investor's profile in Japan uh, is a bit unique uh, when compared to that of the US. You know, US main investors are financial, uh, professional uh, financial institutions, such as a venture capitalist or angel investors. On the other hand, uh, Japan's main investors are large corporations. Various terrestrial industry players we call new to space industry, uh, including uh, telecommunication, electronics, machinery, automobile, trading, airlines, have begun to invest in the space industry. So such a widespread of diverse sector participating in the space industry has not seen in any other country, but uh, I would say uh, it's a feature of Japan's space ecosystem. Let me show you a more specific case for example, our Japanese automobile giant Honda has generated a lot of attention uh, when it announced a strategic plan to develop the micro launchers and also a renewable uh, energy recycling system for the future lunar exploration. And also, uh, SoftBank, a major uh, mobile net network operators, are uh, invested in OneWeb with aim of providing high speed, low latency service from space. Toyota is also partnering with JAXA to develop a crude pressurized rover for the future exploration. 
Various new to space companies see space as a future growth areas where they can utilize our technological and business asset. And uh, collaboration with a new to space company can expand the horizon of the space industry. Their motive for investing in the space industry can be roughly divided into three categories. First is a frontier spirits. They see space as an iconic display of our frontier spirits. And the second is an advanced investment in the emerging space business. And the third one is a major factors or enhancement of their current business. So through the investment, uh, they can bring in a variety of technologies, uh, uh, influx of risk money, and more importantly, they can bring in the demand and end user for the space industry. I would say the collaboration with the new to space company can expand the horizon of the space industry. However, you know, the global space industry remains a closed niche community with a higher uh, technical and regulatory barriers to entry. And also, as we discussed today, so this industry faces a variety of challenges. Uh, various factors such as uh, increase in the number of our players, a conflict of interest among various stakeholders, and also a rising sense of crisis about space sustainability have come into play at the same time. So it's clear uh, we need to evolve space ecosystem. I think that it's important to build a common understanding about current state of affairs, build a larger ecosystem, and uh, achieve long-term progress for the industry as a whole. As we discussed today, private sector's participation will be uh, extremely important for the continued, continued growth of the space industry. Not only aerospace industry, but also various new to space industry should be evolved in the future. To achieve that goal, I'd like to propose to define a comprehensive set of industrial architectures. An open, reliable, and collaborative industrial architecture should be designed so that our various industry can participate more in the space industry and collaborate with each other. This industry architecture uh, should encompass our various elements, uh, including you know, formation of international framework and norms, coordination of business activities, and also a conflict of interest, and incentives for responsible behavior, technical interoperability of a related system, and also a market rules for data and various applications. And such an industry architecture should be built in each space domain, such as Rio, Mio, Jiro, and also the moon. So I'd like to show a specific case in Japan. I think you know the iSpace uh, is one of the most uh, major lunar exploration company globally. However, uh, various terrestrial corporations are participating in lunar development exploration. And the discussion on industrial architecture have begun. You know, to sustain human presence and conduct a various economic activity on the moon, it's important to build a variety of infrastructures, including telecommunication, positioning and navigation, energy, uh, crossing and housing, mm -hmm. as well as the transportation. And these infrastructure cannot be built by space agency alone, nor any one industry alone. So it's likely uh, we will work with various industries to build this infrastructure. However, these commercial activity have a wide range of potential issues, such as ownership of land and resources, uh, human rights, resolution of conflict, and also the debris on the moon. So as we discussed this morning, our Artemis Accord will be playing a critical role to deal with such kind of an issue. However, I would say a comprehensive set of industry architecture should be designed to provide positive business environment to access the collaboration with among various industries in the future. So our, as I have been saying, space industry is full of many possibilities and is expected to grow at a high pace in the future. However, you know, there's a limit what the space industry can do on its own. However, by collaborating with the new to space industries, this industry can make a larger impact on civilization. 
So again, so our, let's evolve our space ecosystem. So together with the new to space industry, so for continued growth of the space industry. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. I especially love the last slide that you had about the collaboration. Thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering in the same length that how and what is it that you're also doing with the industry associations or the collaborations uh, in also promoting space sustainability? Like how is the industry working towards space sustainability through these collaborations as well? Yeah, thank you for the great question. Uh, I think that uh, today uh, I'm talking about the sustainability of the continued growth of the space industry. I, I think the space sustainability includes a variety of meanings, right? So I think one of the key elements is the sustainability of our industry growth. So from this perspective, our new to space industry will be play a key role to expand the market price of the space industry. So as I mentioned, the space is still considered to be a niche market. I think the size of the space or industry is less than uh, 400 billion US dollars. Yeah, I think so. But uh, you know, the ICT industry is about 10 times larger. Automobile industry is about 20 times larger. Right? So space industry is still still niche market. So we need more. Uh, we need more demand users. We need to expand the size of the market. That's the key to our. That's the key to continue the growth of the space industry. So from this perspective, our new to space industry will be playing a key role. So we need to collaborate more. Appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Masa. So we have listened to five excellent pitches on various ideas for how we can address space sustainability. I wanna show a graphic. Many of you participated in our pre-poll to get a sense of what you thought was the most likely or most, you know, where, where are we already making progress in some areas? And so this gives you a sense of, of where that's at. It looks like voluntary stand mar standards, kite marks, and certificates, certifications is in the lead. Um, what I want to do now is actually turn it over to our judges for some closing remarks. And I want to remind you that while our judges are giving closing remarks, the second poll, which is the same poll, is actually open. We want this to be an interactive session. I want to see, um, did any of our pitches change your mind? Let, let's see if we end up with the same answers. Let's see if we end up with different answers. So if you have uh, the same app that we've been using for Q&A, please go ahead and open that for the poll. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and ask each of our judges to take a minute or two, three, um, to go ahead ahead and offer us some closing um, observations. We'll start with Brian. Okay, thanks. So I think the voluntary standards, uh, that has a, there's, a lot, there's a lot of merit there, right? Because we're still in an environment where we're not really set up in the United States, elsewhere, to start um, regulating some of these new space activities. Um, so it's, it's good, I think, for the industry to get a head start by developing some voluntary uh, standards and, and being responsible and adhering to them. Um, I, I think it also makes sense for insurers to incentivize or to disincentivize uh, bad behavior in space. I mean, first and foremost, insurers are kind of worried about launch failures. They're worried about equipment failures. But obviously, um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you have collisions in space, that's, that's, that's bad for everybody. Um, responsible venture capital investment practices, that sounds highly theoretical to me. Um, I think that um, the industry will probably continue to take flyers on, um, uh, on, on some long shot ventures and, um, and, and uh, not really have to look down the road to, to what happens if somebody happens to put up uh, tens or hundreds or thousands of satellites and then goes out of business. Um, and nobody buys those assets. Whose responsibility is it to make sure that, uh, that, that, that they're disposed of properly? Um, Beyond that, I, I like, I, I, I think that we're seeing a lot of companies starting to take, um, household name companies, let's say companies like Toyota and Sony, taking an interest in space. Sometimes I wonder how much of that is really, um, do they really see a tangible business opportunity or does aligning themselves with these projects create kind of a technology halo um, that reflects well on the companies? Um, so I don't really have, I don't really have a, a firm grasp on how much money they're putting into this, if they actually see a business opportunity. Um, 
But um, just to bring it full circle um, with Carolyn's circular economy concept, I think she's described everything we're seeing, right? I think she's described all these pieces that are coming into existence to more or less of a degree. Um, how that circle's gonna close, I don't know. I guess that's what the point of conferences like, like this are. But overall, I appreciate all the, all the conversation we had here about these. Excellent, Ryan, thank Thanks. you for that. So Judy, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, well, thank you so much. First of all, like, I'd like to extend my gratitude to obviously Secure World Foundation for putting this together and to all the pitchers who had some really thought-provoking pitches here. Um, to start off, just considering a few facts and figures that we already had here, like the space economy is obviously worth it at least $469 billion. Um, there are like more than 5,000 satellites that are actively operating in LEO. There's an average of 42 new satellites being launched into orbit weekly and more than 1,800 defunct satellites that are left in um, LEO. And lastly, there are more than 27,000 trackable orbital debris objects that exist alongside many thousands more that we're obviously not tracking. There are five international treaties and several other rules, regulations, policies that are in place uh, and are obviously being developed. In light of this and the insightful pitches that were already discussed here, the space sustainability that developed and emerges for me is uh, the ability of, human, of all humankind to continue to use outer space for peaceful purposes and socioeconomic benefit for the long term. Uh, while safeguarding it from becoming a tragedy of the commons and obviously preserving it both for the present and for the future generations. Um, today we do see organizations such as Space, uh, space uh, Secure World Foundation, Space Safety Coalition, um, the Center for Space Standards and Innovation, which is the research arm for Comspoc, and several others that are, provided comp that are providing comprehensive uh, overviews of challenges and opportunities and how to actually bring about space um, sustainability. We obviously also saw throughout the day that UN USA and several other international NGOs uh, are also in the forefront of promoting space sustainability. Putting all of that together in the perspective of the five pitches that we had, they succinctly highlighted, I'll, I'll talk about three because I, I do want to um, keep it in the interest of time, the importance of long-term planning and responsible practices to ensure the sustainable use of outer space, cautioning us against the potential negative consequences of short-term thinking and unsustainable exploitation, and thirdly, and not lastly, reminding us to critically evaluate the pro uh, proposed solutions and consider their long-term implications for the overall sustainability of space activities. Um, so just in conclusion, and finally, I just want to say that the pictures were not only bringing up ideas, but also being trans, uh, transparent about use, misuse, and also accountability, which is obviously very important at these platforms. By addressing the shortcomings and pushing for stronger measures, we can forge a path, like all of us here, towards a truly sustainable and inclusive future in space. So thank you all for your um, insightful presentations, and let us all remain like really steadfast towards a commitment towards advancing sustainability through rigorous examinations and collective approaches at Astro. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Nicholas, you get the last word. What are your thoughts on today's pitches? Thank you, and I see I have a minute or so, so I'll keep it brief. But as a you know, as a lawyer who does a lot of work in the finance and fundraising space, I was, I was very drawn to how that flows through all the five pitches and really sustainability generally as, you know, obviously I think everybody agrees it's a good thing and we all want it, but how do you, but who pays for it? And how do you have companies that can produce at this early stage a business model that um, can, can show the, the clairs of the world that they're worthy of an investment early on? And, you know, you look at a company like Astroscale that, you know, is obviously a leader in the field and has raised a lot of money, but how many others are there at this stage that can have the money to afford the insurance that we heard about from Chris and to, you know, kind of pull all that together to, to sort of um, put these great business plans to, to practice. I think that's the big challenge and the thing that um, I look for. And then the other the thing that really caught my attention was the reference to the circular economy that Carolyn talked about. Again, I... I mean, a fascinating concept and couldn't agree more. You know, the, the trend seeming to be from the business side that it's, it's cheaper, the satellites are smaller, they're cheaper, they're shorter lived. 
how do you, and Claire, uh, Carolyn touched on this, how do you get the business folks to think about the, the reusability and the circular economy kind of at the business plan stage so that it makes sense from an economic perspective as well as from kind of an, an environmentally sustainability perspective? But really all great stuff and, and likewise, I think we all just need to remain vigilant and, and figure out how we can keep these, these good ideas uh, going and get them the funding they need to come to fruition. I like that. Let's, let's keep the good ideas going because the good ideas going because that's part of what we're trying to do here. We want to tee up new concepts. We want to look through these. And now I want to hear from you, our audience, is the actual last, last word. Uh, we're going to pull up our current poll to see if we, we changed any minds. Let, let's see how our pitches went. So the answer is we actually kind of did change your minds. And, and Carolyn, um, your presentation on circular economy, I think, really introduced some new concepts to our audience who is really showing that this idea of something a little bit beyond recycle, but a much more complex idea of circular economy um, definitely hit the mark in a few cases. Um, so moving on from there, I want to thank my judges. I want to thank our presenters and invite you all to chat with them as we move forward today. We are going to move into our last session for the day. Um, I couldn't be more thrilled. Um, so thank you guys. Um, wonderful. Yes. Wonderful.